Kamala Harris, Rooted in Justice, by Nikki Grimes. Eve slammed the door when she got home from first grade. Eve, you know we don't slam doors in this house, her mom said. What's going on? Teacher asked what we wanted to be when we grew up, and I said president, and Calvin said girls can't be president, stupid. Well, he is wrong, said her mother. Girls can grow up to be president. In fact, a girl from right here in Oakland hopes to be president one day. Life is a story you write day by day. Kamala's begins with a name that means lotus flower. See how her beautiful smile opens wide like petal, fanning across the water's surface? But you don't see the flower's roots. Her roots. They grow deep, deep, deep down. Let me show you. Kamala's family line was a strong black and brown braid, coiling from India, where her mother, Shyamala, was born, to Jamaica, where her father, Donald, was born, to Berkeley, California, where her parents fell in love and married, to Oakland, where Kamala was born. It was a good beginning. Is this like Once Upon a Time? Not exactly, said Eve's mom. This story is true. Right away, Kamala was like clay. Her parents molded for action. When her mother wasn't hunting cures for cancer and her father wasn't teaching, both marched for civil rights and went to lectures by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Kamala was right there too, bouncing along in her stroller, chewing on her pacifier, and words like peace and justice. What's justice? Eve asked her mom. Justice is another word for fairness. Once, when tiny Kamala was fussing, her mother couldn't figure out what was the matter. What do you want, little girl? she asked. Freedom, said Kamala, and a waterfall of laughter sputtered from her mother's mouth. At demonstrations, marchers often chanted, What do we want? And the answer was always freedom. Little Kamala had been listening. Kamala's baby sister, Maya, screamed her way into the world when Kamala was two. In no time, the sisters were having faraway adventures together, like visiting her, their grandparents in Zambia. Grandfather P. V. Gopalan was a senior diplomat there. He had once fought for India's independence. His wife, Rajam, Kamala's grandmother, fought for the rights of women. Little by little on these visits, Kamala and Maya learned that fighting for justice ran in the family. Sadly, when Kamala was seven, her family squeezed into a different shape. Her parents divorced, and her daddy moved to Palo Alto, while Mommy and the girls packed for the Flatland, the black working-class area in Berkeley. Having a long-distance daddy can make your heart hurt. But Kamala's new neighbors welcomed her family with smiles and helping hands, warm as sunshine. Still, Kamala was sometimes lonely for her daddy. Luckily, her godmother, Aunt Mary, lived close by and gave Kamala extra hugs whenever she needed them. Like other black and brown kids in the Flatlands, Kamala was part of a California program to integrate the schools. Every day she rode a yellow bus, bumping through familiar city streets, all the way to the wealthy white part of town, with sprawling hillsides painted with gardens. Thousand Oaks Elementary was a world away, but Kamala didn't mind. There she got to meet kids who were rich and poor, black and white, kids who celebrated holidays she'd never even heard of. There, teachers taught her to count to ten in many different languages, Oh, I can count to ten in Spanish, said Eve. Who taught you that, asked her mom. Guadalupe from next door, Eve said. Eve smiled proudly. School let out before Mrs. Harris got home, so Kamala and Maya spent the afternoons at the Shelton house two doors down, when Miss, where Mrs. Regina Shelton ran daycare and after-school programs with posters on the wall of Frederick Douglass, Sojourner Truth, and Harriet Tubman. Mrs. Shelton was the second mother to Kamala, always encouraging her to have confidence. Once, when Mrs. Shelton bit into a lemon bar, Kamala had made all by herself, accidentally using salt instead of sugar. Oh, delicious, said Mrs. Shelton. Maybe a little too much salt, but really delicious, she said, never pointing out Kamala's total failure. That day, Mrs. Shelton let Kamala walk away feeling successful, feeling like she could do anything. After school, Kamala's days bulged with busyness. She had homework, piano lessons, ballet classes, and Barbie play playtime. Thursday nights were the best, though. The family would go to the Rainbow Sign, a cultural center celebrating black art, music, books, and film. 
James Baldwin spoke there, Maya Angelou read there, and Nina Simone sang there. Nina's gravelly voiced version of To Be Young, Gifted, and Black often rang to Kamala's home. The more she heard this favorite song, the more Kamala thought, I'm young, gifted, and black, too. On Sundays, when they weren't visiting their father, Kamala and Maya rocked from side to side at the 23rd Avenue Church of God, where they tapped tambourines and sang as part of the children's choir. Fill my cup, Lord, was Kamala's favorite hymn. The church was where she learned the Bible, that God asks us to speak up for those who can't, to defend the rights of the poor and needy, like some lawyers do. Her uncle Sherman was that kind of lawyer. Maybe someday Kamala could be one, too. I don't want to be a lawyer, said Eve, but I like making sandwiches for the homeless. That's helping, too, right? Right, said her mom. In her first year of middle school, Kamala would need a lot of cake. She learned a new lesson about change a lesson dressed in down jackets and mittens. Her family was moving north, where 12 feet of snow and her mother's new job waited in Montreal. It will be a wonderful adventure, Shyamala told her girls, but Kamala grumbled. The thought of leaving her friends and the warmth of sunny California made her shiver. It was February, and Montreal, robed in winter sparkling white, felt like it had ice in its veins. Kamala couldn't stop shivering. Worse yet, their new neighbors spoke French, a language Kamala's mother insisted her daughters learn. The English name of the French school her mother picked up, picked, handpicked for them, was Our Lady of the Snows. That's a funny name, said Eve. Maybe, said her mom, but Kamala wasn't laughing. Montreal was no place for a lotus flower. Sighing, Kamala unpacked her new clothes and her old experiences, like marching for change with her mom. One spring day, when the temperature rose enough for outdoor sports, Kamala and Maya marched in front of their apartment building, waving picket signs because kids weren't allowed to play soccer on the front lawn. It wasn't fair, and Kamala cared a lot about fairness. The building manager read Kamala and Maya's signs and changed the rules. Kamala adjusted to life in Canada, but memories of her home country still rang her heart like a bell. After graduating high school, she ached to return to America, where her parents had nursed her on the civil rights movement. She couldn't wait to follow in the footsteps of her heroes, Constance Baker Motley, Charles Hamilton Houston, and Thurgood Marshall. Marshall had attended Howard University, and Kamala decided she would too. On her first day at Howard, Kamala turned this way and that, smiling at the faces of the students from America, Africa, the Caribbean, it was Thursday night that the rainbow sign all over again, where everyone in the room was black like her. They reminded her of home and the people she wanted to help, the people she wanted to fight for. The university would begin to teach her how. Howard seemed like a perfect place to run her very first campaign. It was for class representative of the Liberal Arts Student Council. Her competition was tough, but so was Kamala. Every day between classes, she passed out flyers in the campus and told any students who'd listen why they should vote for her. When the last ballot was counted, Kamala came out the winner. Daddy says, I don't have any competition because there's only one me, said Eve. That's right, said her mom. He should tell Kamala there's only one her. Eve's mom just smiled. Kamala's time at Howard was focused on the future. She competed on the debate team to sharpen her speaking skills. She interned at the Federal Trade Commission. She did research at the National Archives to study the workings of government. And on weekends, she joined fellow students on the National Mall in Washington, D.C. to protest apartheid in South Africa. Kamala was preparing to be a woman warrior. Like Wonder Woman, asked Eve? No, better, said her mom. Wonder Woman isn't real. Nothing matched the magic of her second summer break when Kamala stepped through their doors of the private Senate subway as an intern for Senator Alan Cranston. Kamala could barely hold in the secret of her joy. What could be better than learning from someone whose footsteps echoed in the halls of power every day? After Howard, California called Kamala home to study at Hastings College of the Law. Court cases and contracts filled Kamala's mind, but changing lives filled her heart. Elected president of the Black Law Students Association, Kamala invited major law firms to a job fair so that more black graduates had a fair chance to be hired by the best companies in the country. This work was great practice for Kamala's future. Graduating law school meant there was one more exam to take, the California bar. Without passing it, Kamala could not practice the law. She didn't pass. 
which taught Kamala something new. Failure. It is the toughest teacher, but it can also be the best, because it makes you dig down deep and try harder. On the second try, Kamala passed. If at first you don't succeed, said Eve's mom, try, try again, finished Eve. Kamala was finally ready to climb the mountain of her dreams. First, deputy district attorney. Next, the first female district attorney of San Francisco. Then the first black woman attorney general of California. Peak by peak, she rose, eventually becoming the second black woman voted into the U.S. Senate. Lawyer, prosecutor, senator. The little girl named Lotus Flower had turned herself into a person others could call on for help. Did she use magic to turn herself into that person, asked Eve? No, sweetie. Kamala just used hard work. As senator, Kamala fought for laws to help workers earn more money, joined the Women's Right March on Washington for Equality and Civil Rights, and telephoned lawyers to help immigrant children who came to America looking for someplace safe to live. Each time she answered a call for help, Kamala proved that her family's legacy of public service was alive and well in her. What is a legacy, asked Eve? It's like the inheritance you leave behind for your children. Kamala had traveled far, but she hadn't finished climbing the mountain of her dreams. On Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday on the TV show Good Morning America, Kamala told the world, I am running for President of the United States. She immediately got goosebumps, wondering if Shirley Chisholm, the first black woman to run for president, was smiling down from heaven that very moment. Months into the race, Kamala realized that running for president cost more money than she thought, and Kamala's campaign team didn't have enough. She decided to give up her run for the 2020 presidential nomination. Sad to leave the race, Kamala looked forward to all the good work she could still do as Senator Harris. It's okay, said Eve. If at first you don't succeed, try, try again. Exactly, said her mom. Will Donald and Sh Shyamala's daughter ever get to call the White House home? Only God knows. Kamala Harris is still writing her American story. And so are you. I know what happens next, said Eve. Why, asked her mom. Tomorrow I'll tell Calvin that he's wrong and he's a doofus. Eve Temple, I taught you better than that, said her mother. Okay, said Eve, her fingers crossed behind her back. I won't tell him. The end.